Hey guys, back from a treasure hunting in Kihabara, I picked myself up this thing. It's a Trio, or Kenwood, Trio is the old name for Kenwood I believe, AG202A, a function generator. Goes everywhere from 20 hertz up to 200 kilohertz with a frequency range switch here. Um, we've got output attenuation, output level, square wave and sine wave, and our output terminals here. Seems to work alright, but there are a few things like we've got a wobbly terminal here must have been bumped or something and um, on the back we've got a uh, sink input and a ground and they're all you can see maybe you can see there they're all kind of not looking too happy a bit dirty and whatnot so I've got a few terminals to uh, replace these ones here just uh, gold plated because eh, why not they're cheap basically the same shape as what's in there except they're gold focus and uh, then the same to replace the rear ones so I'm going to put those in and also I'm going to replace the capacitors got some uh, some Nippon Kimikons and we'll um, put those in to replace the caps in there just, just because it's an old machine, old uh, capacitors it's not going to hurt to put new ones in, higher rated voltages and yeah better chemistry and whatnot. But first we're going to uh, test it, see what it see what it's like, see if it needs a calibration and then we can um, tear the thing apart and uh, see what we can fix. Alright so we're hooked up here just got the probe going straight into the, uh, the scope here I've set it to 1 kilohertz and here we're getting 996 hertz so 0.996 kilohertz so that's pretty close and the sine wave is a nice even sort of shape if I zoom in a bit there you can see it's a nice sine wave so if I then I'll bring that back out so if I go to the square wave let it settle down for a bit and that's actually nice as well I'll zoom that up a bit and look at that that's actually pretty good I've already compensated the probe a little bit on there, but that's a nice shape. And that doesn't know what the frequency is because it's a square wave. But um, yeah, that's like, I don't know sure if this actually has a duty cycle setting, but yeah, that's it's working quite well. So it looks like there's nothing that needs to be fixed in this, which is a good thing, makes it easy. All right, so I found this schematic on the internet. It's the uh, correct one for my model. There's a few little bodges I've seen on the PCB, but that's part of the course for an older unit. Even newer units sometimes. But um, we'll work through the basic progression of events in this schematic. So first of all, we've got your mains plug here. The fuse, mains power switch. We've got a um, transformer. Comes through to some diodes for a rectifier and some smoothing capacitors. And that's about it. Comes straight into the circuit and we've got our power. So after that, the next thing to look at is the uh, oscillator. That's this section just here. So we've got our um, our range setting switch and our variable capacitor that actually alters the uh, the frequency itself. We've got a, um, a, a little MOSFET here, a few transistors and whatnot. There's an oscillator, sort of multi-vibrator kind of looking thing around here. That's making our sine wave. So when we've got this switch, this here, waveform, and that switch here is our waveform switch that switches between uh, sine wave and square wave. So your output from your from the uh, sine wave oscillator comes up through here, goes through the switch and comes out through our output level. There's a pot on the front, 10k pot, and that just alters the um, the output level. Then when it comes to back down here, through this amplifier, looks like a push pull or a maybe class A B or a cl class A maybe even. But we've got a um, a small amplifier here. Then it comes out, got a uh, some resistors here in a voltage divider network so we've got our 0, minus 20 and minus 40 dB attenuation and then to the output and the ground is just straight to ground here so that's basically the sine wave section but when we switch this to square wave what happens is what's coming out of this sine wave oscillator gets shunted down into this area into the Schmidt circuit so it's like a Schmidt trigger. So what happens is this is also like a kind of a multi-vibrator sort of thing that 
what it does is as the sine wave comes up and down and up and down it'll reach a threshold that causes this to trigger and that will trigger rather than being a smooth up and down it just triggers on and off and on and off or positive and negative positive and negative in um, in uh, synchronization with the sine wave coming from here so that way when we alter the um, settings on the front panel that's going to alter the sine wave of course but instead of that going straight out it goes through this it converts that sine wave into a square wave that then comes back up here this one here and then through the output level through the amplifier and we get a square wave out here so it's not too complex um, basically just a sine wave oscillator a, uh, a circuit that converts that sine wave to a square wave amplifier and a power supply pretty easy so there's also I've noticed just here and just here we've got some little um, pots and they've got like a it looks like a flathead screw which indicates to me that these ones are used for calibration um, this one it may be frequency or it may be uh, the uh, the output level and this one looks like it might be um, something to do with the square wave maybe slew rate or it might be the uh, balance like duty cycle or something <coughs> we've got another um, pot here but I'm not sure what that one is it doesn't show that little icon so maybe it's just a factory setting and then they leave it it's not for calibration but I'm not sure if that one's not for the uh, the frequency I'm not sure if there's any calibration for frequency um, it may be a mechanical thing with the dial on the front you actually alter the dial itself um, because there's no digital readout so if, it re if it's not reading right so if you set it to a thousand Hertz but it's actually reading 1200 Hertz maybe if you just have to move the dial to suit what the actual output is I'm not sure but we'll we'll have a look and see how far out it is and then we'll um We'll see if we have to change anything. All right, so here we are inside. A little bit dusty, but we'll give that a bit of a clean. Pretty simple looking thing. We've got our main transformer here at the back. Come around to the PCB. Inside here, we'll take this off. That's There's actually a variable capacitor in there. So when I turn the front knob, this main frequency knob, you can see the, the needle moving. It's turning this. This is just a counterweight to give it like a more of a inertia to the fill, more a smooth sort of motion. It's just a cast aluminium, kind of like a flywheel. There's a, a string that goes down to a variable capacitor inside of here, kind of like what you see on old AM radios, the uh, multi-plate capacitor that kind of you know, moves through itself. Have a look at that in a sec. And then there's a uh, multi-position switch here, kind of like an open frame style. That's good. I'm going to use some um, contact cleaner or some deoxit on there just to make that you know all nice and clean again there's no real problem with the switching but I may as well clean it while I've got it here um, we'll take the front panel off when I go to replace these uh, binding posts just two screws at the bottom and it'll move away and then um, we've got our main circuit board so what I'll do is I'll I'll angle this with the camera and we'll zoom in on that circuit board so I can show you those three sections I was talking about before so here's our circuit board in close-up you might be able to see dotted lines around the circuit board around here like this across and down that's dividing into the three sections I was talking about before so we've got a dotted line that comes kind of down here around these caps and down like this and just underneath this cap this radial cap these are the filter caps it says a uh, power supply circuit so this here is a power supply section then over here, you can you might still be able to see, I'm not sure in the light, but there's a dotted line coming along just around this little group of components. That says Shumit circuit. It's a Japanese, so they've, they've Japanified the uh, the words a little bit. So that's actually Schmidt trigger, the Schmidt circuit. So they've spelled it S-H-U-M-I-T, which is, if you imagine, if you take the spelling of Schmidt into the Japanese and back again, you'll mangle the spelling a bit. But that's the Schmidt trigger that's probably going to be doing something with the uh, external trigger coming in and then this whole big section at the top all the way around here that is labeled oscillator circuit so that's where all our our good stuff is happening inside here now I was talking about the uh, 
the potentiometers that I found. There's one here, one here, and then one down here. One, two, and three. But that's pretty much all there is about the circuit board. Um, standard single-sided layout. He's actually got the uh, the copper traces on the top as like a, a black ink. So you, you don't have to take this thing out to see where the traces are. Um, they're drawn just following. So you can see along, oh yeah, this one here, the trace comes over to here, it comes up to there. Makes troubleshooting a lot easier. So um, let's flip this thing over back onto its feet and let's take this lid off. We'll have a look at this capacitor in here. Now I'm not actually going to touch the capacitor uh, you know, to adjust anything because that's kind of a little bit beyond what I can um, what I can comfortably do without risking messing something up. Seeing as it's so close to being spot on anyway, we'll just have a bit of a look inside and see what it looks like. Nice shielded case, and there we go. It's actually not too bad, is it? So if I turn the uh, the dial, you can see that moving. So basically what happens is you've got a set of plates like this and a set of plates like this. Obviously they're kind of three-dimensional, but if you turn them up, they're all interleaved. And then as you turn the rotor, or you turn the dial, which turns these blades or the rotors or whatever you call them, um, they just go like this. So you've got less overlap, less capacitance. You bring them in. More overlap, more capacitance. That's just how it works. So they're not very high capacitance value, but they are variable. So... Yeah, you can't you can't really get a variable electrolytic capacitor, but yeah, these work quite well for what they are. You see this linkage here that just reduces the stress. So if there's any misalignment, this takes up that slack. You see, like the disc, it kind of moves. It's springy, sort of um, spring metal with a little disc in the middle. They're actually good for uh, volume controls and stuff. If you have a long shaft coming down to the back of your amplifier or something, put one of those on, and it kind of takes up any slacker in in anything yeah you might be able to see the string here on the pulley so that's all there is to say about that little box in there so we'll put that back together and let's take this circuit board out hopefully it's not going to be too difficult because it's all wide and there's no actual plugs on it um, let's see how we go and then we can start replacing these capacitors and then we'll just Check to see if it's still in calibration once we've done that. Check this out. Look at the size difference of these things. These are the same values. Th uh, 33 microfarad, 50 volt. Check it out. That's the old one, of course. What a time to be alive, eh? I can't believe how small that is. Technology. Isn't it amazing? Alright, back to replacing these things. Alright, so I've finished replacing all the capacitors. They're all uh, Nippon Chemicons. Easy to get here in Japan, pretty cheap. Good quality as well. They were Elna caps, which are also very good quality, but they were just old, so I figured I'd replace them. You can see here, I've got uh, radial caps in place of the old uh, axial caps. Axial means the leads come in from the ends. Radial means they're coming out the both leads from the same end. The reason I did that is because it's kind of hard to get axial caps these days. Um, mostly they're radial. And um, in the these series of caps, these are like this model, um, I couldn't get them at all. So I'll bring this up here and I'll show you exactly what I've done to convert them. Focus. There we go. So you can see if I move that, we've got one lead with some heat shrink coming to here and the other one just it's been extended. I've just got a bit of uh, a bit of tin copper wire and extended it down to the other end. Put some heat shrink on there to keep it safe, and then I'll just lay it flat. So I'll put a bit of uh, uh, hot snot in there, a bit of uh, the hot melt glue, keep those down and stop them from flapping around, and then we're basically done. So that's all the uh, capacitors. If I tilt that a bit, you better see it a bit easier. All nice. So about those potentiometers, uh, the little trim pots I mean, 
one here, one down here, just there, and one up here. I figured out what two of the three do, but one of them I'm not sure. This one here, it doesn't seem to do anything on the uh, on the scope. When I connect the scope up and I tweak this one around, nothing seemed to change, so I'm not sure what that one's doing. Um, on the schematic, it is VR3. So if someone can tell me what that's actually doing, that would be great. It seems to be something to do with the frequency range. Um, I'm not sure. It doesn't seem to change anything, so I don't know. But this one here, this one's for the amplitude. This one seems to be like the gain of the internal amplifier or something. So I tweak that one up until we see some clipping on the scope, and then I just back it off a little bit. Um, that way we got the maximum output on through the amplifier. We're not like wasting any potential output. And then this one down here, this one seems to be the duty cycle or the asymmetry of the square wave. So I set it to square wave and I tweak that until the bottom half and the top half of the waveform are equal. Because as you turn it one way, you, know, you get a bit of asymmetry. So that's all set so it's equal, 50% duty cycle. This one's set so we're getting a good output and um, it seems to work okay. Alright, moment of truth, eh? We've got the scope hooked up to the oscillator. I've set it to 5000 hertz. Let's see what happens when we turn it on. We are getting 4,900, just over 4,900 hertz. And it's kind of stabilizing 4,920-ish. Yeah, so that's pretty good. That's not too bad for a dial indicator anyway. When I use this, I'll be using it with an, a scope or with my multimeter or something, so I'll be able to measure the exact you know, output and just dial it in perfectly. So, um, so that's it. Yeah, we're a little bit out, but not too bad for a, a device that was built, what, 30 plus years ago. So, I'm happy with that. It's still working. Let's check the uh, square wave. Square wave is still good. No worries. Pretty clean signal, so hey, it looks like a win. Alright. I'll give that a thumbs up and uh, we'll see you next time.